Oh no. Almost no Sorry. <laughs> Is there something? Uh, yep. <clears throat> some task I could assign myself to like get ramped up. Oh yeah, for op OpenGL. The question was if you don't have any op OpenGL experience, what you should do? Yeah, like get some like OpenGL Hello World type of thing, like display a rotating teapot, rendered with diffuse color or something like that. That that would be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, shall we get started? <coughs> so I guess, uh, yeah, so Tintin covered the last time the base basics of differentiation, <coughs> and today we will continue in that direction. I will connect it a little bit more to physics and explain you why, why is it relevant, and we will do one important example, the spring, Hooke's law. Uh, then on Wednesday I'm planning to cover some basics of rotations and quaternions to set up the ground for the next three classes, which will be covered by Robin, uh, because I will, be, I will be gone, I will be traveling, but he's <coughs> it's actually good because he's the expert in rigid body physics. Um, he wrote a really nice rigid body engine. He's our visiting uh, um, scholar from Germany, and then he will be going back to Germany. So it's your last uh, chance to learn some cool tricks of the trade in rigid body dynamics from him. I, I only wish I could be here for his lecture because his engine is pretty cool. <laughs> so that's, that's the immediate plan. And then in terms of the homework, there won't be any homework for a while. I think the first one will be the rigid body homework, but we still have to prepare that. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit more about differentiation. I guess I want to first motivate it. Why, why you might be like wondering why do, why do we like bother about these math preliminaries? Because you all, all you should know something about calculus and something about differentiation. But, <coughs> Two things, so first it's really important if it's based animation. Typically the papers which you will be reading assume that you already know uh, how to uh, compute derivatives of things. And usually that's what people struggle with. In theory it's simple, right? Because in theory you just like follow the, the cookbook procedure how to compute derivatives of things. But as you will soon see, uh, I will let you do an, an example here. It's very easy to get lost in, in it and ma make a mess and, and, and get it all wrong. <laughs> and I have seen it many times actually, like students, even very good students who are like implementing things. Even myself, I, I also like, it's very easy to just mess it up and get, get it wrong. So, uh, yep. Oh, um, the TA said last class would be a homework assignment, like a off -ramp. Yeah, that was a little bit, uh, yeah, right. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention. So we, we didn't have Canvas and Piazza set up back then, so that was a little bit of misunderstanding. So I'm actually going to cover that, and we'll do a little bit of that homework, essentially, in, in the class. It will give you a little bit of an opportunity to, to, to compute it yourself. So yeah, that's, that's not, not a, it wasn't was supposed to be an optional homework anyway. I thought he would mention that the class and actually tell you what the homework is so you could think about it, but that, that did not happen. So we will do, we'll, we'll cover that today. So by the way, in terms of the organizational matters, the website should be set up, the Canvas and Piazza should be all sent and you should be all enrolled. If you are not, if there are some, there's always some, like if somebody like signed up late for the class or something, then, then let us know. Ideally through Piazza, especially if you have a problem with Piazza, that's ideal. <laughs> okay. All right, so, so let's, let's go back to differentiation and physics. By the way, most of the lectures will have exactly this format where I'll be writing something here on the paper. I do have some slides, <coughs> but mostly it will, it, will, it will be like this and the slides will be also like annotated slides. So in case you are like expecting a lot of programming and so on, uh, that you might be disappointed. The, again, the, the main problem of his based animation is to get the math <coughs> right. Since you're already here, you should all know how to turn formulas on the paper to code <laughs> and get it, get it running on your computer. So that's not what the class is about. The class is about so you understand uh, what, what the principles are behind it, how to get the math right, and this lecture, how to get the derivatives right, because that's a big part of this based. Okay. So why, why is that? So one of the elementary principles in physics is energy, right? just to give you a little bit of motivation. 
and forces, right? And these two things, they are related exactly by differentiation, right? And today we will do one very specific example which will show that very clearly, clearer than this camera is showing it, but it's a little focus problem. Okay, there we go. Oh, I can also improve the method. Is that better? I could also darken it there, but then you might be falling asleep. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't dare doing that. Are this also being recorded, or you? Yes, I'm also recording it. And Tintin's lecture from last week already was recorded, and there is a link to it from the from the new website. <laughs> In case it's still showing up, Spring 2014, you might need to hit refresh on your browser because it might have cached the old version of the website and didn't notice it. It got updated. <coughs> Okay, so I was saying that ener from energy, we get to forces by differentiation, okay? And I will show you a very specific example today. And we can go even further. Uh, more often than not, we also need to differentiate forces. And what we get is a stiffness matrix, <coughs> or tensor, or some people even call it a tangent a stiffness matrix or, or tensor. But all, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, all the time is the same thing as the derivative of forces, okay? And that will be um, important in implicit time integration, which is something we will cover later. But today we need to prepare the ground so that when we are covering it later, um, we don't have to go back and talk about differentiation. So, so, so trust me that all, all these things will be very directly applicable to creating physics-based demos later on. That this is one of the most important building blocks. So speaking of important building blocks, let's start with um, probably the simplest physics-based model for elastic things. That's the Hooke's law. That's what we will be differentiating today. So basically, it's like differentiation by example on Hooke's law in 3D. You could be also doing uh, physics in 2D, but there's not much difference. So we can do it straight away in 3D. Not much difference in this case. So what is Hooke's law about? Hooke's law tell us, tells us <clears throat> what is the energy of a spring. Okay, so let's say I have a spring. So I have two particles. Let's call them P and Q. And let's say at their rest both, that's where they start with. They are P0 and Q0. So this P0 and Q0, those are just three-dimensional vectors. Okay. The rest length of the spring is L0, so this will be the rest length of the spring. So L0 is just a scalar, and the L0 is the norm of P0 minus Q0. Nothing special going on here. And this is a <coughs> spring. <coughs> Hooke's law tells us what is the potential energy of the spring, E, P, Q. So the E is an energy function. It's a function which goes from R6 to R1. And do, does anybody dare to guess what is the, or does anybody want to tell me what the Hooke's law is? Maybe you'll remember it from some physics class. <coughs> what we want to do, <coughs> so here, here is what's going on. We have, a, this is a spring in the rest pose. We have two particles connected by a spring, right? And what we want to do, we want to measure the energy stored in the spring due to deformation, okay? So what can happen to a spring, the spring can get stretched. Maybe I can show it here, like get stretched or can get compressed, right? In either case, there will be some elastic energy stored in the spring in case, because it gets stretched by probably by applying some external forces to it, right? And once you release the external forces, it goes back, right? So that's exactly the idea of internal or potential energy stored inside a spring. That's, uh, that's probably the simplest physics-based model you can think about. But later on, we will be talking about simulation of mass spring systems, and that's where Exactly this model will be super relevant, but for now it's just an example to explain that the basics of multivariate differentiation. Okay? So what <coughs> anybody dares to guess the potential of a spring? So and in the rest pose, it's P0 and Q0. At the rest pose, the length of the spring is L0, so that there's some spring has some length. And now and I'm, I'm at some deformed configuration, and I'm at some arbitrary points P and Q. So now you can imagine the spring is moving. Maybe some external forces are acting on it. Some, somebody's pulling on it, right? And I want to compute for a given P and Q, what is the current energy of the spring? You have a? Well, it's because of, of the spring's overturn. 
over two? Yeah, I also like over two. So the, the k that will be a parameter of stiffness. Yep. So uh, p, uh, p minus q norm. That's right. P minus q norm. Minus q zero and q zero norm. Yes. Yeah, so I will I will I will call this L zero. <coughs> exactly. So that's exactly Hooke's law. So let's um, talk about this. What 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 does this mean? By the way, this, this L0, th this is indeed just the norm of P0 minus Q0. That's the rest length of the spring. I could also say that L is just like a convenient substitution. That's the current length of the spring, okay? So remember, uh, the idea is I have a, a rest pose, and then I have some, some deformed pose, some arbitrary pose specified by P and Q, and I'm computing the energy of the deformed pose, okay? Because of course, if I, um, so we can, we can, so uh, I guess let me explain that this is the stiffness parameter. <coughs> this is stiffness, we can, uh, so what the stiffness means, that's just a scalar parameter. So the K would be uh, like this, a non-negative uh, number, saying how uh, hard the spring is. So that, that's sort of like the most primitive material model you can be thinking about like a spring made from some really hard steel, like, like spring you would have like in a car muffler or something like that, that would have very high K, right? And if you have some sort of rubbery, mushy spring, that would have probably very low K, okay? So for uh, the purpose of differentiation, we can just ignore that. We can just say that the stiffness is one because uh, that's not what I care about right now. What I care about will be the derivatives and the, the gradient and the Hessian of the spring. But, <clears throat> so optionally you can add the stiffness, which is just like a weighting term, okay? So first thing you can notice, so if the current length of the spring is exactly equal to L0, so maybe the spring is in some other configuration, but so maybe this is my current configuration P and Q, but it turns out that this length is exactly still L0. So what's the energy of the spring in that case? Zero, right? There's absolutely no elastic energy stored in it. So you can immediately see that the spring can translate and rotate arbitrarily and nothing happens to the elastic energy, right? So if the spring gets stretched or, so if we have, if we have L greater than L0 or if it gets stretched or compressed, right? So if L is greater than L0, that means something like this happened to it, right? We, we stretched it further away. Then we will find out that the energy is strictly greater than zero. But you can immediately see the energy can never go below zero, which is what well-behaved energy should always be doing, right? There should be no such thing as negative energy, even though it wouldn't really matter because usually what, all that matters are the derivatives and they would certainly be agnostic to a constant. I think it's a good manner to have energy which is non-negative, right? So E, P, Q is always non-negative. And in case the length is not exactly the rest length, the energy will always be positive. So I guess uh, one thing to note is that it doesn't matter if I compressed or stretched the spring. In both cases, it's the same type of elastic energy. In both cases, the spring will be basically resist resisting it, okay? Okay, so this is the energy. That's like the most fundamental concept you can think about. And now we want to uh, compute forces out of it, okay? So if I have a spring in some general configuration, to be able to simulate it later on, when we will talk about time integration and so on, I need to be able to uh, compute what forces are acting on each of the nodes, on the P and Q nodes, okay? So how do we do that? using differentiation, okay? So if I take the gradient of my energy, so my energy is a function, it's a multivariate function. That's, that's really the, the reason why we care here about multivariate calculus, all these uh, energies, even for such a simple model of one spring, they are already multivariate, <coughs> right? So the gradient, uh, as you discussed before, will be one, one by six vector. Right, and it's the vector that stacks all the partial derivatives with respect to px, py, pz, qx, qy, qz. Right, so I can also split the gradient 
into two pieces, gradient with respect to P and gradient with respect to Q. Okay, so this is still a one by six vector and these two guys are one by three vectors. Okay. This P means just I'm just differentiating with respect to P and assuming that Q is fixed. And here I'm differentiating with respect to Q, assuming that P is fixed. Okay. Is that is that clear? Did Tintin explain it well enough the last time, or shall I do some more explanation of the gradient? Yeah. So where does the one by six come from? One by six? Yeah. Uh, it's because this is this is going from R six to R, so it has six input variables that would the input variables would be px p because we are in 3d so the the p is a vector maybe i should be like writing arrows everywhere <laughs> but there will be a lot of arrows so i don't want to do that so the p has three coordinates px py pz and the q has also three coordinates q x q y and q z okay and if we are differentiating we are taking partial derivatives with respect to all the coordinates right so i do with respect to px with respect to py and so on. And those are exactly the elements of the, of the gradient. Okay? And the physics interpretation of the gradient is very beautiful. So the negative gradient with respect to P of this uh, energy is exactly the force acting on the, the, on the node P, on the particle P, due to elasticity of the spring. Okay, so this is the force acting on particle P. Maybe I should say internal force. Internal meaning due to the spring itself. And minus gradient with respect to Q would be, of course, the force acting on particle Q. Okay? So what would you expect before before we compute the gradients and actually put put some hard math, math behind it? Let's let's think about it intuitively. What would what you what would you expect from the forces? For example, let's say that this is the rest length of the spring, and let's say that now I took the spring and stretched it like this. So I have now P here and Q here. Where would you expect the forces to point? <laughs> This is sort of intuitive, right? Doesn't I think about physics, physics base, if you imagine a spring, sort of easy to guess, right? So they would probably be pointing inwards, right? They would, they would want to basically resist the stretching of the spring because in my current state, somehow I stretched the spring. Maybe there were some forces acting on it, so it got, it got stretched. And now the force, the negative gradient of energy is pointing in a direction that the spr spring plus Q, that the spring goes back to its rest pose, okay? Now what if I compress the spring instead? So if I took the spring and compressed it a lot, then where the forces will be acting now, do you think? Will they, will they be pointing in the same direction? No, they will be pointing in the other direction, right? So this would be, this is my P and Q, my minus gradient, minus gradient, <clears throat> that's also what the stiffness meant that's just basically a scaling of the forces right if this if the spring is very stiff then that means this gets oh th this this direction gets directly multiplied by the k so the stiffer the spring the larger the forces will be so even even without even even without writing any math we can already like think um, can realize a lot of properties of what what do we expect so uh, formally speaking or slightly more formally speaking we would expect the gradient to be proportional or to be parallel to the direction of the spring the direction is p minus q right if i have my spring p q then the direction is this this arrow p minus q and i certainly expect both the p derivative the p gradient and q gradient to be some scalar multiple of this right because it would be sort of weird if the forces were acting in some direction which is not parallel to the spring. Right. The other thing we would probably expect is that if I sum these two gradients together, what do you think? Oh, sorry.
I would bet it worked better. So what would you expect the sum of the gradients to be? Zero. Zero, exactly. Do you want to explain why? <laughs> because the forces are acting in opposite direction of each other, and theoretically they're the same. Right, the magnitude should be the same, right, and uh, they should be exactly opposite. And the reason is that uh, the spring should not be able to move by itself, right? <laughs> There's this thing, I don't know if you know it, the, what's the guy? Like, you cannot pull yourself out of the swamp just by pulling on your shoelaces, right? What was, what was the story? <laughs> There was some book, I'm blanking on the name now. The, uh, anyway, the, the point is that the thing cannot set itself to motion, right? There, there are these cons conservation laws in physics, the center of mass. If there are no external forces <coughs> acting on it, the center of mass of the whole system, meaning of, of the two particles, cannot change. In the same way, it also cannot start spinning, which is, which is the reason why the forces, they, they could not be acting, for example, like this, right? Again, the spring cannot spin itself <laughs> by its own internal forces. Okay, so this is what we would expect, and let's see if the math will, will give us that, okay? So let's, what, what I want to do now is basically an ex exercise in multivariate differentiation. And I want to actually compute the derivatives of uh, the spring. So specifically, I want to compute the, these gradients. And once that's done, then I would like to also compute the Hessian of the energy. What is going to be the Hessian, by the way? We know that the gradient is a 1 by 6 vector, right, in our convention. Could also be 6 by 1. That doesn't matter a whole lot. What is the Hessian? Six that would be a 6 by 6 matrix. Yeah. Do you, do you already know some more about the matrix? <laughs> Positive, definite, I'm not sure, it might be. <laughs> it's certainly symmetric, <laughs> that's for sure. One spring might be, for two springs it will get a little bit more complicated. We will, we will get there, let's, let's first compute that, okay? So how do you compute a derivative of something like this? So I guess the most obvious possibility would be just write it using coordinates, right? So I could, what I could do would be to just do this, um, not too fast. So I would just say this is pi minus qi. This is indexing the coordinates x, y, z. So from one to three, can you see? Not very well, it's weird. <coughs> Strange, I did not have to do this before. Hmm. <coughs> square root to get the Euclidean norm minus L0 squared, right? And then what you gotta do is to compute the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to P, P1, P2, P3, and similarly Q, Q1, Q2, Q3, right? So J goes from one to three and K goes one, two, three. Oh, everybody knows how to compute partial derivatives, I hope. Or what does it mean, par partial derivative? Or shall I repeat it? Basically, the, the, the point is that you, if you are differentiating with respect to one of them, you treat all the remaining variables as constants. I hope you, you know that from some calculus class. So everybody knows how you would compute it this way. You can, you can actually try it. What I would actually suggest is for you right now to try to compute at least the gradient. You can do it this way, or you can do it the way using the multivariate calculus rules. Uh, Tintin showed you the last time. But I'm actually good exercise to try it both ways so you can compare. In this case, it's not such a big deal to compute it directly, but you will probably find out that using the multivariate calculus rules is much more elegant because it allows you to stay in this um, <coughs> vector or in more, more generally uh, matrix notation. 
without getting all messy with the indices. It, here it's relatively simple, so it's not such a big deal, but so, so you can try. So I would suggest this, try, try to compute the derivatives. In the meantime, I will uh, write down the multivariate calculus rules, and then I will uh, compute it using those rules, okay? So why don't you go ahead, do you, do you, do you have this? All you need is this, this formula, and you, you need to compute the gradient of that. That's what I originally meant to be the whole work. <coughs> we can just do it right now. <coughs> okay, so in the meantime, I will write the multivariate differentiation, differentiation rules here. If you don't know where to get started, then you might be looking at this because, oh, because that might be a good starting point. <laughs> I'm trying to fix this camera in the meantime. It's oh, it's the projector that's the problem. Okay, so I'll try to fix it while we're trying to differentiate. refuses to do that. 